next week is spring break for Leon County Schools. I will be joining Christy Williams and a group of high school youth who leave right after worship, probably actually maybe during the last hymn, to uh, take off to Atlanta for a mission trip. And I know there are other high school students in the congregation who will be making one of those college tour checkout trips, you know, where you, you drive around to several campuses and see which might make your A-list. When, when our son Adam was at that stage in his academic life, we made a whirlwind trip to my alma mater in Memphis, Tennessee. It's a 500-mile drive. We arrived on a Thursday night, as I recall, and on Friday morning, we went to campus. Adam took the tour and went to a couple of classes, and I tried not to drown in nostalgia. <laughs> Before we jumped back in the car to drive right back to Tallahassee, I got this silly notion in my head. I went into the office building where my favorite professor had had his office in my day, and was surprised to see his name still on the building directory. Just on a whim, I, I walked up to the third floor and knocked on his door, and I heard his voice, and he said, come in. With some trepidation, I, I opened the door, ready to apologize for interrupting this fantastic scholar late on a Friday afternoon. He looked up from his desk and he said, Hello, Brant. How nice to see you. <laughs> it had been 25 years. Who knows how many students that man had had since then. Not only did he remember me, he called me by my name. Some scripture passages are like that. You remember them, and they remember you. How old must I have been when I committed to memory John 3, 16? Five, four, perhaps, maybe younger. Of course, it's in the King James. Uh, that's how my Sunday school teachers taught. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I wonder how many sermons you've heard on that text. How many of them were preached by me? I have seen just those words on T-shirts, stamped on keychains, up on billboards along the interstate highways. It's an old, familiar phrase, comfortable as a broken-in pair of moccasins. But does it have any punch left in it? Has it still the truth in it? And in this age of many faiths, is it still good news? The words are John's, of course, the gospel writer John. They're a commentary on the conversation that Nicodemus had with Jesus. Nicodemus, the Pharisee, who had come to Jesus in the dark of night to ask him some questions which nobody else could answer. Nicodemus, as you may already know, joined, belonged to that group of religious leaders who made a big point of keeping up a united front. The Pharisees really worked at discerning God's will and worked even harder at doing it. And when Jesus came along and told them that they were getting further away, not nearer to the kingdom of God, they did not take that very well. Like religious leaders under pressure in every age, they circled up the wagons. So Nicodemus puts on a raincoat and pulls a fedora down over his eyes and goes to see Jesus in the darkness. He told Jesus how much he respected him as a teacher and how he was sure that God was with him. And before he could go any further, Jesus started talking in riddles. 
He said, in order to have eternal life and enter the kingdom, you have to be born anew. Nicodemus couldn't get his head around that. He asked some more questions which showed that he did not have a clue what Jesus was talking about. Jesus went on to talk about being born of water and the spirit and the wind blows where it wills. Then he cited an obscure story about Moses in the wilderness and a snake on a pole and lifting up the snake and how the Son of Man must also be lifted up. Like many conversations in John's Gospel, this one takes place on several levels at the same time. It's hard to tell who's on first without a scorecard. But the essence of it seems to be this. Nicodemus is closer to the kingdom of God in this conversation he is having with Jesus than he has ever been in his life. All those credentials, that doctorate of divinity, all those degrees hanging on his wall, all those commendations, none of it means a thing now that he has met Jesus. Then like a playwright who all of a sudden walks out upon the stage from the wings on the opening night of his play, John walks out and addresses us directly. You aren't getting it, folks, are you, he says. I'm making this far too complicated. Stick with me. Everything comes together in the last act. But perhaps it will help to remember this. The story that I'm telling you is about God's love for the world. And the key is Jesus. Keep your eye on him. Watch what happens. Listen to what he says. And when the play is over, Take it home with you, and it will grow on you. Remember, it's about God's love, and the key is Jesus. Now, not everyone hears John 3.16 this way. For some, this is not a message about God's love so much as it is a message about right belief. For John, for them, John 3.16 is about, about believing in the right way. The text does say, whosoever believeth in him will have everlasting life. Belief for them means proper doctrine, right teaching, orthodoxy. It means giving assent to the right set of theological ideas. There's a group in Tallahassee whom I greatly admire. All of them are Christian pastors, and I admire them for two reasons. One is that they spend a lot of time praying for themselves, uh, praying for one another, praying with one another. The other is that they're the most interracial group of clergy in all of Tallahassee. I admire them so much that I asked if I could join I wrote the president, and he sent me a pamphlet which listed all the admission requirements. I read the list carefully, and then, with a sigh, I put it away in a file cabinet. You see, I don't qualify. My thinking about Jesus doesn't meet their standard. Oh, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I trust him as my Lord and Savior, and I have declared that I will be his disciple to my life's end, but that is not enough. In order to belong to this group, I have to sign off on a whole other set of items, such as the infallibility of the Bible, the virgin birth of Jesus, the resurrection of the dead to eternal damnation. The Apostles' Creed and the Nicene's Creed won't get me in. In order to belong, I have to be a real Christian. I have to really, really believe in Jesus. And that, I think, is not what the Gospel of John means by belief. 
belief in Jesus or in the name of the only Son of God. Belief in John is not just a scent to doctrine about the Christ. It's a sharing in the being of Christ. It's coming to Jesus in the darkness, even though you know that if you stand too close to the light, to the light he brings, to the light he is, all of your shabby pretensions and deepest fears will be brought to light as well. Our need for Jesus is what draws us to him, but as John knows so well, our need is also what keeps us away from him. Suppose I do come to him and he turns me away. Suppose I let him know who I truly am and he rejects me. Suppose after standing in the darkness so long I knock on the door and he has forgotten my name. Those who believe in him are not condemned, writes John, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light. Believing in God's only begotten Son is less a ticket to heaven than it is the mark that you already, by some miracle of grace, are headed in that general direction. It's finding that you are standing in the light, exposed for who you are, but still standing nonetheless. In Johannine terms, it's being born again, born from above. It's receiving, not qualifying for, but receiving eternal life. Or as Paul puts it in that portion of today's reading from Ephesians, it's realizing that by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your doing. It is the gift of God. John calls it belief. Paul calls it faith. Either way, it's a gift. It's the way God saves the world by sending Christ to be the light. It's God who does the sending and God who does the saving. Eternal life, John's word for salvation, is stepping out of the darkness. It's opening the door. It's standing in the light who calls you by your name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.